Glad that you're back this evening. We want to continue in the study that we have been engaged in the, the past couple of weeks on kinds of followers of Christ. Christ is to be our example, as we mentioned this morning. We are to follow Him. We are to walk in His steps. First uh, John 2 and verse 6. Uh, we are to have His mind, Philippians 2 and verse 5. Uh, he is truly our example. The Bible, though, as you read and study it, depicts different kinds of followers of Christ, though, as to how they follow Him. And we've noted several different types already, those who follow Jesus so far off. In other words, uh, that was um, like Peter at, at the trials of Jesus. He didn't want to get too close at that time. And so he followed Jesus so far off. There's the bread seekers of John the sixth chapter, where they only fo <clears throat> followed him to get the food that he provided for them. Uh, they didn't really care about his uh, the truth that he was going to be presenting. Uh, they were just out for what they could get. There's the glory seekers. Diotrephes certainly fell into that category. He wanted the preeminence. He wanted the glory and the, the honor, the power that went with uh, being in charge. And he was the man, as we might put it today. Uh, and certainly he and those who would be like him today need to learn the uh, principle of human, uh, humility within their life. There's then the critical. We saw that with Judas when he criticized uh, Mary is anointing the feet of Jesus uh, in John the 12th chapter. And he didn't really, he used an excuse, uh, this should have been sold and given to the poor, the money given to the poor. But in reality, all he was interested in was getting the money himself because he was a thief. And he's the one who had the bag or carried the, the money. But there's also the fussy. Those that follow Jesus, but they're just fussy. In Philippians, you have a, a great congregation there. And it has been referred to as Paul's sweetheart church because of the relationship between Paul and the Philippian brethren. They are the ones who sent money to him and they served as... Uh, his sponsoring church in that regard, as we would refer to it, in that congregations sent money to the church at Philippi, and they then sent that money to Paul. And they were a great congregation. Albeit they did have a few problems. And Paul tells them, for example, in chapter 3, to beware of the false teachers, those who would be dogs. Uh, and he's referring to there the Judaizing teachers. Well, as you enter into chapter 4, though, you see another problem. And this one centered around two women, Euodius and Synthache. And he tells them, I beseech Euodius and Synthache that they be of the same mind in the Lord. This relationship between these two women had deteriorated to such a point that it called for public mention. Now, what that problem was between these two women, we don't know. The Scriptures don't tell us. And we won't know in this side of eternity. But it was a problem within the church there. And so there's that admonition in the Scriptures by Paul in writing to this church you exhort them, you beseech them, be of the same mind. In Amos, the uh, third chapter, we would see that two individuals cannot walk together unless they be agreed. 
Paul is setting forth for them the principle you walk together. You be of the same mind. Now, what Amos is talking about in his uh, epistle and when he makes the statement is that here's individuals who are walking with him. And they can't be in fellowship unless they are walking with him. You take someone who is in fellowship with God and someone else who is in fellowship with God, they're going to have fellowship. However, if someone's not in fellowship with God, then you can't be in fellowship with them. Two cannot walk together except they be agreed. The two there would be specifically God and Israel here. You can't walk with God unless you're agreed with Him. Unless you come under His obedience to His will. Well, the same principle is in relationship to the third person if you throw that in there. That here's two individuals. They cannot be and cannot walk together unless they are in agreement. And if you're dealing with God and spiritual matters, for these individuals to be agreed, they have to have agreement with God as well. If they're going to be on God's side. Now, of course, they could as we see in denominationalism, for example, the several individuals will walk together and be agreed, but it won't be with God. They will exclude God from that because they don't obey His will. But we're dealing with now, if you want to be in agreement with God and you can't walk with someone who's not in agreement with God. Here is Euodius and Synthache. Whatever problem it was that they were facing, they needed to be of the same mind. They needed to walk together. They needed to be together. Or else, one of them at least is not going to be in agreement with God. It could not be. War and Peace is the title of a book. We're not really dealing with the book, but there is that aspect of War and Peace. Whether that war is a carnal war or a spiritual war, warfare is always costly. Paul would set forth a principle in Galatians 5 and verse 15 that if ye bind and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. When there is fighting and war within a congregation, it's going to be costly to that congregation. That congregation is not going to be able to do the work that it needs to be doing. It's certainly not going to have the unity that God wants it to have the peace that should be residing within the congregation. It's going to have an influence in relationship to other people who are outside of the body of Christ as they see that fighting and fussing, whether it's spiritual matters or physical matters. It doesn't make any difference. They still see that, phys that fighting and fussing and they don't understand and thus it does put a black eye upon the church and upon that congregation. And I know of many congregations who they're not going to get over the black eye that they have given themselves in the community until a whole bunch of people die out. And that's just the fact of that. Because they fought and uh, fussed to such an extent that the people in the world, they saw it, and there's just no way of getting over it within the lifetime of those individuals. Peace within the congregation is not really a, a luxury, it's a necessity. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We need, we must have peace within a congregation. 
Paul would write in Romans 14th chapter, in verse 19, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and the things wherewith one may edify another. In the 12th chapter of that same Roman letter, in verse 18, he exhorts us that if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And yet, when you have a situation within a congregation where you have fussing and fighting, and that's the way in which some individuals, it seems, follow Christ. All that they want to, uh, all that they do produce is fussing and fighting. Then you're going to have problems within the church and within the, your relationship with the world. God wants us to be at peace, be unified. Now we have to understand that there's that aspect. There's the need for peace. There's the desire that we all should have for that type of a peace and the desire to make peace. But there also is the obligation that we have to contend earnestly for the faith. Jude verse 3. That we cannot allow false doctrine error to reside within a congregation. And thus, there's going to be times in which, yes, there is going to be fighting. Why? Because there are some individuals who very simply are not going to remain faithful to the will of God. They're not going to subject themselves to what God says on a matter. And so, yes, there's going to be fussing and fighting with those individuals. Why? Because they're stubborn and self-willed instead of submitting themselves to God's Word. Now, we've seen that, for example, uh, years ago with the marriage, divorce, and remarriage question. That here is a congregation, and basically at one time, just about all congregations talked the same thing in that regard. It's called, in fact, sometimes by individuals, the traditional view. We generally sum it up, one man for one woman for life, with one exception, and that is fornication. And then the one who is innocent of that has the right to put away that guilty or that fornicating party, and the innocent person has the right to remarry. That's the position that the church as a whole taught. Why? Because that's very simply what the Bible teaches. But some individuals come along and they started teaching something different. And they started allowing a situation where if people practice what they believe and what they taught, you're going to have fornicators and adulterers filling the Lord's church. And so what had to happen? There had to be a fight about that. Why? Because some individuals, very simply, would not submit themselves to the will of God on this matter. And so they opened it up to fornicators and adulterers. And said, just come on in, we'll accept you. Well, there had to be a fight about it. To adhere to God's Word. And some, continuing to refuse God's Word on the matter, and as a result, we can't have fellowship with them. But what happened? It was a fuss. It was a fight among brethren. But there's also other matters in which, while we might have discussed and, in a sense, debated back and forth, yet we realize that these things should not cause a problem and we should not be fussing and fighting over these matters. For example, how does the Holy Spirit dwell in the Christian? And we have those who believe that the Holy Spirit will personally come into the heart of the Christian and personally dwell within the Christian's heart. You have others who say, no, the Spirit doesn't personally do this. He does it representatively. And thus, as the Word dwells in us, then the Spirit dwells in us through the Word, or through that uh, agency of the Word. And so He is not personally in, in us, but He dwells in us representatively. 
those who hold that uh, the Spirit dwells personally in us, when you get into that discussion, there's another. There's two actual groups in regards to that. There's those who believe that the Father and Son dwell representatively through the Spirit in the, in the Christian. And so the only one that dwells in the Christian is the Spirit, and the Father and Son do not literally dwell in the Christian. They dwell representatively through the Spirit. Others would say, no, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three dwell within the Christian. Now then the question comes, and let me say, we have through the years recognized that this is something that we don't withdraw fellowship over. We can discuss it, we can hold our different views, and yet not be in that fussing and fighting type attitude in relationship to it. Now what's the difference between those two positions, for example? If one holds a view on the Holy Spirit as to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that might be wrong. Now, I'm not saying which one is wrong and which one is right. But, one, but both of them cannot be right. One of them is wrong, one of them is right. What difference does it make, though, as to how we're going to be saved, whether one believes in a representative dwelling or a personal indwelling. What difference does it make as to how we're going to worship God if one believes in a representative dwelling or a personal indwelling? What difference is it going to make as to living the Christian life? if one believes in a personal indwelling or a representative indwelling. Those, that view has no effect in relationship to becoming a Christian and living faithfully as a Christian. Another way in which we might put it is, it is not a salvation issue. In other words, it's not going to affect my salvation if I'm wrong on the indwelling question as to how the Spirit dwells in us. Now then, on the other hand, if I should say, well, the Spirit works in my life today, then in effect I have denigrated God's Word I've said that I don't really need God's Word because I have the Spirit guiding me and directing me and how I'm to live and what I'm supposed to do. He's going to tell me what to do. He's going to help me in overcoming sin. Well, if He's going to help me in overcoming sin, then if, he, if I sin, whose fault is it? Why, it's the Spirit's fault because He didn't give me enough help. That affects how we live and how we act. The marriage, divorce, and remarriage question that we mentioned. Why is it a, an issue over which to contend earnestly? Because it does affect the salvation, the souls of individuals. If you tell an individual over here, a couple over here, that is in an unscriptural marriage, they've divorced for some cause other than fornication, and you just tell them, oh well, that's fine, you're alright, then what have you done with them? They are in a situation that Christ says in Matthew the 19th chapter and verse 9 is adultery. What's going to be the result of those who commit adultery? They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. They're going to spend an eternity with, God, with the devil in hell. Now then, if you tell them you're all right, then you have affected their soul salvation. That's something that is important now. That's something over which, yes, we must contend over because it's affecting the salvation of individuals. We have to be wise enough to understand the distinctions between those two things. Whether this is a subject 
as to whether or not this affects the salvation of an individual. You know, there's some individuals, for example, that hold that the book of Revelation was written prior to AD 70. You have others who say it was written later on around AD 90. And have some that will take the middle of the road at date, middle 80s or so, early to middle 80s. What difference will that make in someone's salvation? It doesn't make any difference in relationship to an individual salvation. Thus, we might discuss these matters, yes. But fussing and fighting over? No. However, when someone looks at this subject, and let's just say uh, using the illustration of that uh, date of revelation, and they start coming along and say, well, you got to believe this date. We're not going to fellowship someone who believes, let's just say it, an early date of, of Revelation or a middle date of Revelation. You've got to believe a late date, 80, 90 to 95. And they start fussing and fighting over something of in, that is inconsequential, then it comes under this type of condemnation. We need to understand you'd be at peace on those matters. Why? Because you need to understand those are subjects that do not affect someone's eternal salvation. On the other hand, you have those that do. Those subjects that affect the eternal salvation of man. When you, when you teach a doctrine or believe a doctrine or practice a doctrine that affects the church, whether it be the the way in which one enters the church, whether it be the worship of the church. Why is it that back in well in nineteen the early nineteen hundreds it was officially recognized a division between the Christian church and the churches of Christ? Because the churches of Christ recognize that once you pervert the worship of the church by bringing in the instrument of music, then you pervert it that worship and you cannot be saved in that type of a situation. You pervert the organization of the church. Those are matters that when you pervert the church that our Lord died for, those are subjects that deal with our eternal consequence. And yes, you must fight over those things. You must contend for the truth regarding those matters. And to be very blunt, in what's taking place today, you have Dave Miller over here with Apologetics Press. And he taught a, in a sermon a doctrine that undermines the authority that God has placed within elders and places the elders in reality under the congregation, the opposite as to what God sets forth. Now, should we just ignore it when it undermines that organization that God has established within the church? Of course not. How can we? And be pleasing unto God. And yet that's the position of many of our brethren today. Just ignore it. Well, why don't we ignore then a perversion of the worship of the church. Why don't we ignore the any false doctrine dealing with the plan of salvation? Why not ignore that about Christian living? If you can ignore one aspect, then why not everything? But we also need to recognize that not everything is a salvation issue within the Bible. But then there are some things that are just matters of expediency. We don't have to do it. We can do it. It's a matter of, is this best for the congregation? Elders work in that realm of expediency. God has set forth certain laws that we are to subject ourselves to. Now then, 
In relationship to those laws, there is the fulfilling, the expediting of those laws. Carrying out those laws. How are we best going to do this? Well, some people in those expediting of God's laws are going to be fussing and fighting all the time. They certainly come under the condemnation of God in regards to that. They need to learn that spiritual type of warfare of fussing and fighting is costly to souls. They need to learn to be at peace. Hey, it's interesting. In 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, Paul tells us to be submissive to the elders. And he says, when you do that, you will be at peace among yourselves. You won't be fussing and fighting over these matters because you will have submitted yourselves to the authority of the elders in those matters. A few years ago, we updated the, this building. Put carpet, new carpet in, added the pews. That was a matter of expediency. But, for illustrating illustrated purposes. I guess this carpet is green. If it's not the, the true green, then uh, whatever color you want to call it. Let's say somebody else over here wanted red carpet. Someone else over here wanted blue carpet. And they get, you get into a fight over the color of the carpet. Now, uh, is it right? Do we have scriptural authority to put carpet down? Well, certainly we do. I'm not going to take time to show the Bible authority for that action, but yes, we have Bible authority to do such. Okay, what color are we going to have? And literally, there have been congregations in the past who have split over the color of the carpet. A matter of expediency, and yet fussing and fighting over that matter of expediency. In that, those areas, that's what 1 Thessalonians 5 is talking about. The elders are those who have the final say in that and making the decisions in those expedient matters and you submit yourselves to them and the re end result of that is peace. But when it's, I've got to have my way and my decisions are it and you start fussing and fighting, that's when you devour one another as Paul puts it there in Galatians 5.15. And that, brethren, is wrong and sinful. And thus, there are some individuals like that. You just cannot satisfy them no matter what you do, how you do it. They're always going to find something to gripe and complain about. They're going to be fussing about something. And Paul condemns them for such. They need to learn to be at peace. Peace with themselves and peace with others. And that starts out within the congregation by submitting ourselves first to the authority of God and to the authority of the elders. But there are those who follow Christ who are simply the fussy. Then there's those who are fearful. In Mark, the fourth chapter, starting in verse 36, it says that when he had sent away the multitude, they took him even, a, in, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he, that, he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they wake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? 
And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey? Fear is the product of little faith. In Matthew's account of this, Matthew the 8th chapter in verse 26, it says that he said unto him, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? And then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. In Mark's account, it was that, Why are ye so fearful? Have ye no faith? There is a direct link in both of them that Jesus makes between faith and fear. You have no faith. You have little faith. As a result of that little faith, you have fear. If they had great faith, they would not have been afraid. we many times become fearful. We become fearful of those events, the things that are taking place within our society. In fact, uh, some people become so fearful of things within society they can't even leave their house. They're stuck there. Why? They're simply fearful of things. We become fearful of things as well. The Christian doesn't need to be fearful. In Matthew the 6th chapter, in this great Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells them to uh, lay up for yourselves treasures upon, or lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves do break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's verses 19 through 21. And then if you come down to verse 24, he emphasizes the fact no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. From this point, he then goes into a discussion of the necessities of life. And he starts showing you don't need to worry about the necessities of life. There's no reason to be fearful about those things. And he uses several illustrations that God takes care of His creation. And you're of more value than those things if God takes care of His creation, don't you realize that God will take care of you and provide you the necessities of life? And then in verse 33, we're told to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be provided unto you. And then he sums up the discussion in verse 34 by saying, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You don't have to be fearful about tomorrow or the next week or next month or next year. God will give you the necessities of life. Those things that you absolutely need, God will make sure that they're there. God will provide for you. You don't need to be fearful or afraid of those things. Have no fear, have no need to be afraid of men and what they might do. In Hebrews 13 and verse 6, Paul would write, So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Thus there's no fear of persecution. Jesus tells us to fear not them which are able to which are not able to kill the soul, but are able to kill the body. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't fear the man. He's only able to kill the body. He can't do anything to your soul. 
No need to fear what man can do to the persecution that he might bring. And that's stated Matthew the twenty eighth or Matthew the tenth chapter and verse twenty eight within the context of Jesus sending out his disciples and he's telling them, You're going to be persecuted. Don't worry about it. Don't fear those individuals who are able to kill the body. Don't worry about that persecution that's going to come upon you. That's what we discussed this morning in relationship to suffering. And Paul would say, our light affliction, which is but for a moment. St. Corinthians uh, five, or 4 and verse uh, 16. Or verse 17. It's a light affliction. I don't fear what man can do unto me. That which he might bring in the persecution that he might bring upon us, it's nothing. It's a light affliction. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to be afraid of it. Because I have God with me. I have the promise of God that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And that's why I don't have to fear what man shall do unto me. Because God's on my side. We many times, though, become afraid of man. Ever been in a situation, for example, where someone brings up a subject of the Bible and that you know they're saying something wrong, but you're afraid to say anything? Why? Because fear has taken hold of us. And it's preventing us from doing that which we know to be do, that we should be doing. Someone's engaging in some activity that we know is wrong and sinful, and we become so afraid of the of man that we don't say anything about it. We don't tell them their sin and expose that sin and wickedness. Fear has gripped us and we become afraid of man. And we don't have to be. But we know if we speak up, well, we're going to suffer some persecution. We might be ridiculed. We might be ostracized. They're not going to pay any attention anyway and so we start making excuses that I don't have to do it. And yet, that's what we know we should be doing. But because of fear, we fail to do it. That friend and that neighbor or that work associate that we know that we need to be teaching them the Gospel of Jesus Christ, but we fail to do it. Why? So many times it's because of fear. And again, we'll start making excuses. They might ask me something I don't know. Well, so What? I haven't met the person yet that knows everything. I think I've met a few that think they know everything, but they don't. Some people have even accused me of thinking I know everything. I know I don't. There's a lot of things I don't know that are revealed that I need to learn. And then there's a lot of things that are very simply are not revealed to us. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, secret things belong unto God. A lot of times we talk about that part, that which, but the latter part of the verse is that which has been revealed to us. There's things that have been revealed to us that we should know, but sometimes we don't. Lack of study, lack of knowledge. But we can find those things out. But we become so fearful, we fail to do what we know that we should be doing. We're afraid of men. We're afraid of what they might do, what they might say. Their reaction to us. And fear grips us so that we're not doing what we should do. Why? Because of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. That's why we're fearful. But then there's also no fear of death. 23rd Psalm is a beautiful psalm. Our shepherd's psalm. 
And in verse 4 of that psalm, he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Here is the valley of the shadow of death. He says, there's no need to fear. I know that Christ has destroyed Satan and the power of Satan. Hebrews, the second chapter, the latter part of the chapter, discusses that very subject. That Christ has be taken on him the form of man, the likeness of man. And through his taking part of humanity, and yes, being tempted in all points like as we are, dying the death of the cross, he destroyed him that has the power of death, that is Satan or the devil. And so there is no need to fear death. If you look at Philippians, the first chapter. And while Paul believed in his heart that he would be released from the imprisonment that he is in when he writes this Philippian letter, he also recognizes the fact that Nero, the Caesar at the time that he's going to stand before Caesar, that Nero could say, put him to death. Now he doesn't expect that. He expects to be released. But he says, in effect, it doesn't matter whether it be by life or by death, Christ is going to be magnified in my body. Look at chapter 1 and verse 19. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Death will just be the victory. And he says, my, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And that word depart, an interesting word. It was used of great ships that had been built. And you don't build that great ship to keep it in the harbor. You let the mooring ropes go that hold, held it to the harbor so it could go out into greater areas, greater service. it would depart from the harbor. And that's the word that Paul uses. For me to depart is simply going off into something greater. It's to be with Christ. Fear of death? Oh no, I don't fear death. I welcome it. Why? Because it's only going to give me that opportunity to be with Christ. And so there's no fear of death when we have great faith. That great faith, yes, has to be built and it has to be established through obedience to the will of God. Obedience in all that we do and all that we say. All of our actions, all of our speech, all of our thoughts. Bringing all those things in harmony with God and His will. Growing daily. Stronger. Not being fearful or afraid. But having great courage instead. So many times the Scriptures were told to be courageous. Be men. Quit you like men. For example, in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13. Let's be courageous. Don't be fearful. Why? Because what will bring that is great faith. Studying God's Word and abiding by that Word. Now, if you've never obeyed that Word this evening through your faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son and His death upon the cross that He died for us, Repent of your sins and then make the confession of your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And then let us baptize you in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Begin that walk, that life of faith whereby we live according to the faith. If you have begun that life, we haven't continued to live according to the faith. You need to come back and turn this, this evening 
and repent of your sins and let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them. And why not do that as we stand and sing the invitation song?